Um, so I wanted to start off um, just, we, we've got a phenomenal record going at Montana Resources with Safety and I just wanted to touch on that and make sure everybody's aware of it. In July this year, you know, uh, we will have nine years without a lost time incident. That's an incident where something happens and an employee can't make it to his next scheduled shift. So I mean that's phenomenal, it's a, it's a record, it's, it's huge, you know, when you look at what we do um, and, and all, the, all the tasks that our employees have to, to get done, I mean we're by far are the softest element <laughs> in our environment there. And uh, to have a record like this is just speaks volumes for the employees. Um, you know, you, you don't do that without their help. So, uh, well, I mean, you don't do that at all without them being very aware, not only of themselves, but everybody around them, and being empowered to say, hey, this doesn't look right. So, I just wanted to start off by saying, you know, this is a great record and, and, and lots of kudos to our employees. They're, they're great guys and they're a great crew, so. Um, so, I did this presentation a couple weeks ago at SeaTac, uh, and uh, I, I went a little shorter than I think they thought I was supposed to. So I added a few things in here, and this is more of a <laughs> this is more of an update on some of the, the some of the uh, high-profile Superfund activities we got going at uh, Montana Resources right now. Uh, bring you up to date uh, real quick on the waterfowl program on the Berkeley Pit. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know, but this, this, this program's been going since 1996. And uh, from 1996 to November of 2016, you know, there was about roughly 100,000 waterfowl documented on or around the Berkeley Pit. Um, over that period of time, there was uh, about 200 mortalities. So the program up until November of 2016 was, was performing very well. On the evening of November 28th of 2016, and I'll probably never forget that date for the rest of my life, there were literally tens of thousands of light geese. I've learned that not all white geese are snow geese, but together there are light geese. Uh, you know, perhaps 100,000 geese were in, in the Butte Valley. And a lot of those, because of the conditions at the time and the amount of available open water for them to, to roost on, uh, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those birds ended up in the Berkeley pit. Um, it was uh, it was a pretty uh, pretty incredible two weeks. Um, uh, you know, our guys, you know, they tried everything, worked real hard, got the vast majority of them out safely. But uh, you know, there was several thousand that that never left the pit, and that was that was a tough deal for the guys that tried so hard. Uh, it was a tough to deal for this community, and uh, one of the first things we we wanted to do is is start collecting some experts and asking, what, what the heck happened? I mean, in 20 years we didn't see that many birds, and one night we get, you know, what what caused that, and what what could cause that again in the future? Um, so we set up a waterfowl uh, mitigation advisory board. Uh, Stella's on that board. Um, we searched for experts. We got, you know, uh, ad, you know, adv advocacy groups. Uh, you know, Audubon Society. Um, you know, obviously Montana Tech. We got a retired um, high school professor that is just an avid bird watcher that does a lot of contract work, um, counting birds and identifying birds. We got ex U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service people on there, and we just collected up as much expertise as we possibly could and got them together and said, hey. What the hell happened, and how do we prevent this from ever happening again? And I, I got the advisory board has been just a, a lifesaver for us. I mean, we're miners. I'm an engineer. I don't know anything about this type of stuff or what causes it or how to prevent it. And they have just given us a tremendous amount of information uh, so that we can we can manage this situation a lot better than we've ever been able to do it before. Um, they advised us on what hazing and prevention tools are working elsewhere. Um, and they, they set up this network, uh, you know, in the fall, way to the north of us, all the way up into Canada, in the spring, all the way down into Colorado, um, California, and the, the, the migratory pathways. And they tell us 
what's coming. You know, and they say, hey, you know, you got a lot of birds staged up, you know, that, that could have a potential to come into the pit. They, uh, then we go on different levels of alert, you know, all the way from continuously manned observations and hazing, um, you know, down to a more relaxed state. Um, we, have a, we have a contract meteorologist that works with the bird experts to try and predict what weather, pattern, weather patterns can get these birds moving or, or going to let them stay. You know, the biologists will tell you, you know, that as long as they got, you know, when they're coming down from the north, as long as they got food and, and a place to roost, they're going to stay until something pushes them out. We just know a lot more of what's heading our way and how to be prepared for it. We've done a lot of work with the observers, uh, you know, our employees on identification training. We've got them some really good optics. So they tell what kind of birds. And what we're learning is different hazing techniques work on different birds. Some, some birds, if it's daylight, just leave them alone. They're not going to fly in the daylight. They're a night migrator. So just leave them alone. Uh, you know, the, the, all this leads to better data collection and trending analysis so that we can better, better utilize the tools that we have in, in, a, in the best way possible. So we're really seeing, you know, even just after a year of this, we're really seeing a lot of optimization of um, strategic use of our tools and, and advanced warning. So, um, you know, 2017, we kind of fall back into the same pattern we saw, you know, for 20 years. We, we saw a few more birds, likely due to the better optics and identification. Um, we also saw a few mortalities for the same reason. We're, we're better able to see it. The observers are better trained to what to look for. But we're still, statistically speaking, we're still about 99.7% effective of hazing birds off the Berkeley pit. So things are going, things are going real well. Um, I think we're in a lot better position now if November 28th were to happen now than it was than we were in 2016. In fact, I know we are. Um, you know, some of the stuff we have, we have this, um, it's called a VRAD, a vortex ring avian deterrent. It actually shoots out a, a pulse of air that disturbs a, a very large area of air. The birds just hate it. Um, you know, uh, pretty, pretty impressive critter. Um, so, you know, that's one of the new things that we've added. Um, it's uh, really impressive at night, very effective at night. Um, we've got things like, I've got a little video of this drone. It's, a, it's dressed up like an eagle. You know, obviously waterfowl don't like eagles. We've got all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, copter type drones. You know, here's another, there's two of them here. We've got a, a boat that we can deploy on the water, a high-speed airboat. Um, this is video taken off of uh, the Montana Tech uh, sampling um, drone boat, remotely operated boat. This is a propane cannon that we got mounted on it, so we take it out there and there's some birds it's chasing around. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've got a lot, a lot of, a lot of new, new toys, I guess you could say, at our disposal. I'll just show you a few videos of these things, if I can. Um, whoops. Uh-oh, it's not going to let me do that. I'll do it this way. And you kind of get a little sound with it. It's it's very quiet. It's supposed to be stealthy like an eagle, and you need to run that thing down on top of the water. Yep. So that was a, that was actually a video we shot from the salesman. So he's like, yeah, you can take off and land. You can actually catch the thing as it comes by. <laughs> Um, here's a, we've got a noisemakers on top of the helicopter, this helicopter that's specifically designed to irritate the hell out of birds. 
We take that down, just hover it right over top of them. Usually that's enough, we can turn on the noise. Actually, we've got this fitted now where they can actually drop water balloons on the birds. And then we can hover over them and drop water balloons on them. Um, and then we played, uh, uh-oh. Went this. Um, had to speed this one up a little bit. But we've uh, played with some fireworks, some pyrotechnics. We got them where we can actually land these fireworks in the water and put it. You'll see here pretty quick that it puts a hell of a shock wave in the water. By the way, this is the same guys that put on the show up at the M. <laughs> you can see the water. You can see the the water down over here, and you'll see one land over here to the right in a second. But these guys are actually building us a trailer and, and giving us a training, the ATF training, where we can do this ourselves. Real, there's an effective technique right at dusk, so I think that's it. Okay, any, any questions on the birds? We're going to move on to something else real quick. How much do you, uh, as far as budget, what does it cost? Well, you know, with the manpower and stuff involved, it's, it gets a little pricey. You know, some of this equipment is not the cheapest in the world. I don't know that I've ever really tallied it all up, but it's, uh, it's pushing towards a million bucks, you know, for what we've got in just for... 2017. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of that was one-time purchase, like the VRAD and stuff like that. Was there originally a bird mitigation plan in the rod? or did it come after? Was it a response to the original? Beginning? Yeah, the rod. The rod was issued in '94. Um, the original snow goose incident was '95, okay. and the plan was written in '96. Okay. That plan was incorporated into the consent decree. Is there a way to assess deaths once they've already flown off? Or? Um, no, there isn't. These are actually actual birds observed dead on in the pit. You know, whether they wash up on shore or we spot them out in the middle of the water. Um, you know, one thing we didn't see from the large goose incidents when we had, you know, flocks of, you know, thousands of birds flying off, there wasn't a trail of dead birds from here to Dillon. In fact, we did recover one bird in Dillon. Um, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service down there got a report of a bird that was put in with uh, the necropsies for oh, another dozen birds that were not necropsied, and that one bird actually had a shotgun pellet in it. It had been shot. We don't use shotguns, so it had been shot somewhere else and died in flight. That was the only bird outside of Butte that was ever recovered. So we think, and, and the toxicological studies support the fact that you get them out, get them to fresh water, get them to food, they recover fairly rapidly. It's not like an, an acute effect that, you know, they're flying dead or something. If and when there's more development down East Park Street or Galena near to the pit, will you have to worry about noise? And I know you can't really hear it anywhere in town now, but... Well, yeah, there's, there's, some, <laughs> there's some people say they hear it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I mean that's that's just something we got to you know worry about as as it comes on is trying to get more geared towards you know our our neighbors you know right now you know we we rely a lot on very noisy things that that's audible to the human senses so you know maybe we can time goes on we can adapt to things that aren't as audible to humans but are are equally effective so. I just wanted to ask you so with these techniques that you find. 
it's obviously working much better, but would you actually be planning to do that as long as the pumping of the work a bit, you think? You would, would you yeah, it's, need to it? as, as long as a pit's a hazard, uh, waterfowl will continue you know what we're seeing and we'll talk a little bit about it when we talk about the pit is we do we are seeing uh, improvements to to water quality in the pit yeah. so yeah, probably right now those improvements only uh, affect the duration before effects but over time you know it may improve to the point where it's not a hazard to waterfowl yeah. we'll just <laughs> but as long as it's a hazard we'll, we'll try to do it. yeah so just you mentioned oh tracking data and trends, I mean, it, is, it sounds to me like there's kind of like a dy dynamic change that's taking place over the years as you've been through. Is that trending valid or does it actually, I mean, it's more accurate now than it was 10 years ago? Probably. Well, I, I guess what I was getting at when I was saying that is, you know, there, there's a sequence to the migration. You know, some birds come down, you see them, and then they pass, and then the next set of birds come down. and and those things have different responses to different hazing techniques and that's kind of the, what we're trending and tracking there is okay you know you've got you know you got 200 coots on a pit you deal with them different than 200 mallards so that's what I think is what I was trying to get at there any more questions so here, here Pat's gonna come up and do this one <laughs> you thought you were off the hook. Yes. So I thought I'd give you a little update on the, on the parrot tailings because we are, um, we are involved in that. Um, little heads up here on this drawing. This is a civic center. This is Harrison Avenue. This is, this is Farrell Street or Continental and comes around into Shields here. Um, you know, this is the Berkeley pit. Okay. So in this area right here, there's been identified some historic um, smelter and, and um, mine waste. And uh, the state uh, natural uh, resource NRDP program has uh, elected to use some of their settlement money to get these tailings removed. You know, obviously it was kind of natural that, uh, you know, where are you going to put them? Um, so it's kind of natural, hey, let's go over here. Um, and our, the original idea was we'll put them in the Berkeley pit, you know, dump them over the side or fill in a ramp or do something. Um, we met, we being uh, MR and NRDP, kind of met some resistance from certain parties to doing that. And we just said, hey guys, you know, you know when, you, when you get tailings, you want to get them removed, you know, just bring them up into this area right here. It's an area adjacent to our main haul road to the primary crusher. And then at night, we'll just come by on a back haul when we're hauling ore, we'll just load up that stuff and take it and put it somewhere in the mine, wherever we're dumping at the time. So, um, you know, good project. It keeps, keeps the trucks off the highways and off the roads. This is, this is all going to be done with off-highway or off-road trucks. Makes it a lot more efficient, a um, lot cheaper and a lot safer because uh, you know if they the alternative locations for disposal weren't very attractive you know you know by the Kelly and stuff like that those those places were it was going to be a lot of over the road trucks to get it done so this seemed to be a, a, a hand in glove fit between this removal project and the mine and so you know we're, we're just happy that we're able to contribute and get this taken care of um, Pat correct me if I'm wrong the bids have been released for this is a Oh, Pat, geez, I got, I got Vinny over here too. He's in, in this up to his neck. But this is phase one. It's kind of the ball field down, uh, down to the parking lot at the Civic Center on the north side of the Civic Center Road there. They've got bids out on the street right now that you're going to get responses a week from Friday. Right. So be interesting to see how those come in. It sounds like there was a tremendous amount of interest from local contractors. So... I don't think there's going to be a shortage of people submitting proposals on us. I don't know, anything you want to add, Pat? Josh? That's great. You nailed it. So, so, I don't want to speak for your project, but phase one, I think you were thinking would be done towards the end of this year or early next year. Yep. And then, of course, phase two, 
you know, for those of you that are up on this, 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 this phase two site has the county shops on it. It's a little, little more complicated to get that one all wrapped up and done. So looking forward to seeing when that happens. So uh, we're also, you know, if there's any groundwater intercepted, collected stormwater off, all that kind of stuff, you know, we're, we're this, this is what we call, <laughs> I hate this name, but this is what we call our emergency pond, but it's basically our main tailings pump house overflow pond. So we said, hey, you know, just run a pipeline up and put it in there, or if it's just a little bit and you just want to truck it, just bring it over to the guard shack and we've got a, what we call the clear water ditch they can put it in. So hopefully we can, we can manage any water that's encountered in this project too. And here again, it's a, we're right there. It's a, it's a hand and glove project. It's a good fit. So any questions on parrot tailings? Cause we got two experts here. So did I understand correct, Mark, that the tailings will just be dispersed around the mine, not put into the pit? They're not going to go in the pit. They'll, they'll be treated as if they were our own waste from our mine. So. It will be waste and won't be extra, you won't be able to do any recovery of it? No, we did some, we did some tests, you know, um, we, got some, we got some materials from uh, Pat and the Bureau of Mines, we did some tests. And, and, and here again, I'm, I get a li limited understanding here, but essentially the tailings, most of the t copper from the tailings is already leached out of the tailings mass itself into a high clay content layer with high organics. And the copper is absorbed onto that high, the, the clays and the organics. And we can't extract that. We can't extract it through our milling process because, you know, for, for milling, we're looking for sulfides, and these are definitely not sulfides. And our leach circuit, you know, we're just leaching with water. It, this stuff has a higher affinity for the clays than it does for the water, so it's just not really something we can, we can recover. Although, we looked at it. <laughs> what are the areas going to be used for post cleanup? Is there still going to be a field and everything? Or just <laughs> uh, at this point, we've talked to people who are both. They're the landowner, so they're going to extend city center parking lot to the east and then they'll have a developable parcel on the north side of Civic Center Road and a developable parcel on the south of Civic Center Road. And they plan right now to have a green corridor along Silver Bowl Creek to do that. Um, but that plan hasn't been vetted through a public process yet and we to be so to do that. Any other questions for Pat? <laughs> <laughs> What depth are you going to go down to remove the tailings? Might be, oh. Pat, right now there's about 10 to 12 feet of Berkeley pit overburden on top of the tailings. 10 to 15 feet of tailings, and then three or four feet of native soil below that. So our plan is to go all the way to get that native soil out. If we still find contamination under that, we can keep it dewatered over like that as well. So probably, if you were standing at the shops now and post project, there would be about 30 That's about where the water is. If you go down the middle of the hotel? Correct. Total volume, uh, Total volume is 30 Finland hotels. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. Okay, right, so um, talk a little bit about the 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 discharge project we got going, the Berkeley Pit Treatment Project. Um, you know, why, why this is happening now, um, you know, that, that type of thing. Uh, so the, the plan is, is later this year, early next year, we'll start pumping water out of the Berkeley Pit, pass it through the Horseshoe Bend Water Treatment Plant, and then that water from the Horseshoe Bend Water Treatment Plant will come to the, come to the concentrator run through the concentrator, go up to the tailings impoundment, um, and, and be used in the MR circuit. Now out of the MR circuit is where we'll discharge water. So I'll get to that in a little bit, but why now? Um, why is this important? Uh, we're currently doing what they call the remedial action adequacy review for the Butte Mine Flooding Remedy, which that's a long way of saying, hey, we gotta prove this thing works. So. Um, there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of questions that need to be answered to determine whether, you know, or how to make this thing work that really can't be answered without actually doing it. So 
that's where we're going right now is we're going to do this and, it, and you can't just you know set up a discharge system and discharge for three months and say yeah we can do it you know you've got to see it through seasonal cycles and 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 other um, you know other parameters that, uh, that you're only going to encounter by doing it for multiple years um, so the goal here is if if all this works is we will we will maintain the Berkeley pit at its current level or lower depending on you know where we want to where where it makes sense to keep it but probably pretty close to its current level and one of the things is is the Berkeley pit we talk about the critical water level in the Berkeley pit but it really isn't just the Berkeley pit that has that same critical water level there's another dozen compliance points uh, spread out around the Berkeley pit things like the Belmont mine shaft the pilot butte the Kelly the granite mountain a bunch of wells to the east all those have the same critical water level and the Berkeley pit is a sump so it has the lowest water level of all those compliance points so the critical water level is never going to be triggered by the Berkeley pit it's going to be triggered by some outlying compliance point right now the pilot butte is roughly 25 feet higher in water level than the Berkeley pit and that is the highest point of compliance within the monitoring system so if we start pumping on the Berkeley pit what happens to the water level in the pilot butte does it does it respond to that pumping or does it just keep rising because if it keeps rising that's a different problem to solve than just pumping the Berkeley pit so that's a big one uh, we we have reasonable amount of confidence that it'll respond you know when we when we saw the big sloughs in 98 and uh, 2013 most of those points of compliance responded quite rapidly to what happened in the Berkeley pit so there's probably a pretty good connection although when you look at you know these are supposed to be underground workings you know eight by eight pipes essentially why is there 25 foot ahead differential between the Pilot Butte and the Berkeley Pit? So we know it's not a perfect connection, but we know it's a pretty good connection. So that's one of the big, one, big questions we're looking to answer. The other one is, is the Horseshoe Bend Water Treatment Plant's never treated Berkeley Pit water. It's treated water very similar to Berkeley Pit water, but not Berkeley Pit water. So what does that effluent look like relative to the effluent from that water treatment plant that we're used to? You know, that's been running for oh coming up on 14 years so we've got a pretty good idea of its capabilities but we're going to feed it a different water what does it what does it do with that water and what does that effluent look like um, and then and discharge you know it's been well it's been since it's been since the anaconda days that there's been a discharge to silverbow creek what kind of impacts should we expect from that what kind of implications could that have um, so all these things and, and when you talk about you know what's the implications to Silverboat Creek to a discharge you know that's not something you're gonna get a feeling for in three months or even a year right maybe we have a dry year maybe we have a wet year maybe we have an average year you know we need years of data to figure out how all this all this meshes together in a in a productive manner um, the other thing is is uh, what we're hoping to do is get the tailings impoundment water balance to a place where you know if all this works out the water balance can accept the Berkeley pit water and we we can dis we could discharge water when when we want it and not if we don't want to it, it can be something that can be turned on and off and used in the mining the mining circuit but in order to do that in uh, 2013 we had some tailings dust issues um, you know our, our, our air permit requires us to keep the beach wetted to the maximum extent practicable and they said hey you know you could have a bigger pond in this thing and less beach and you'd have less tailings dust so we for over the course of the next three years we brought in a lot of water from Silver Lake to make the pond bigger and the beach smaller now we have a different system to keep the tailings uh, wet we have multiple discharge locations and we can selectively discharge tailings wherever we see dry beach so we don't need that big pond so we want to get the pond down a little bit um, it's the best management practice for tailings impoundments you only have as much water in them as you need to operate so this helps us reduce that and get the water balance back into into a condition where we have a lot more options
So, you know, what does this look like? It's pretty simple, actually. Just follow the lines. <laughs> so, so in, uh, oh, I think it was about 2006, we built a pumping station right here in the Berkeley pit. And it pumped water up to the precip plant. We recovered the copper and let it flow back down in the Berkeley pit. We're going to resurrect that pumping station. It um, needs a little, little TLC. It hasn't been uh, had any attention for many years. And this pipeline up to the precip will bring the Berkeley pit water up to the precip plant where we can recover the copper. And then from the precip plant, it will go to the water treatment plant. Currently, the Horseshoe Bend water that is collected in this area is what goes to the Horseshoe Bend water treatment plant. That water will be collected in a separate system and pumped up to the tailings impoundment up here and released into the tailings impoundment. The, uh, so that frees up all of the capacity of Horseshoe Bend water treatment plant to treat Berkeley pit water. We're going to start off with about 3 million gallons per day coming out. That'll hold the pit about steady right there, but we'll probably test higher and lower flow rates just to see how the plant reacts. And just as the treated Horseshoe Bend water leaves the Horseshoe Bend water treatment plant right now, it gets put into the return water line, comes down into the mill, it's used in the mill, it's mixed with the tailing slurry, and then it goes out in the tailings lines. But before it leaves the mill, this time what we're going to do is we're going to add just, just a bunch of extra lime to the tailings. So we're going to supercharge the tailings with lime. So then the tailings with that extra lime gets pumped up to the tailings impoundment where it's mixed in a mix box with the, with the collected horseshoe bend water. Now this is a, that's essentially the exact same thing we did in 1996 to 2000. So we're pretty, got pretty high confidence that that's going to work. So that gets that gets mixed with lime, that essentially gets treated, the precipitation reactions to treat the water come out in on top of the tailings beach. We get clean water returned to the north end of the tailings impoundment. And from the north end, we'll, we'll just, with our return water system that we already have, we're, we'll pump an additional 7 million gallons per day out of the tailings impoundment, down the return water line. We'll split that 7 million gallons per day out of the return water line upstream of where we put in the treated horseshoe bend effluent. We'll bring it over by the water treatment plant. We'll put it through a polishing treatment. From the polishing treatment, we'll bring it on, we'll bring it on around. This, this line is not where the pipe's going to go. It's going to stay in this pipeline corridor. We'll bring it on around into the mill yard where there's an existing pipeline that we'll tie into that will take that treated and polished effluent down to the confluence of Blacktail Creek and Silver Bow Creek. And we'll discharge it down by Montana Street. Simple, huh? Add a little lime, pump some water in circles. Is there any thought of putting that water uh, upstream from the Blacktail confluence, say up by the Civic Center or somewhere like that? Um, so I, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you my disclaimer, right? Yeah. So <laughs> Montana Resources is only a party to Butte mine flooding. Everything from our fence right here down is we're not involved in. So I am not an expert or have any technical knowledge of that remedy downstream of mine flooding. My I've been told by the people that do have that knowledge that a discharge above. Um, that the confluence here is not compatible with the existing remedy. But as I understand, just, you know, just reading the newspaper, that remedy is in flux and there's going to be some changes. So from an MR perspective, you know, um, you know, you know we'd, we'd, put it, we'd put it at Texas Avenue and, and, and Farrell Street, I mean, but our understanding is that there's a potential that water could get recontaminated, there's a potential that the existing remedy, the sub-drain, could get overwhelmed, there's, a, there's some negative implications there. But if that changes, you know, we're, you know, whatever, whatever they, the parties on priority soils decide is an appropriate place to put that discharge, we're, you know, that's fine with us. So. It's hard for me to speculate a lot on that because I don't understand all the technical issues. What, what is the water quality coming up in terms of you know, pH and, and any 
any sort of constituency of water and temperature? Good question. So, so let's talk a little bit about this polishing facility right here. Um, what we've been we've been um, sampling the return water line. Well, we've been sampling it for a long time, but here recently, we've been sampling it for both total and dissolved metals. And what we see is the 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 difference. And you know, to get a dissolved metal, you filter it, and then you measure the metals after you filter it. What we're seeing is that meets water quality standards if it's filtered. If it's not filtered, it's kind of touch and go, which leads me to believe most of the metal loading is associated with particulates. So if we remove the particulates, we're good on the metals. Um, the pH, uh, the, the, the tailings impoundment pond runs at a pH 10 and a half to 11. So we have to acidify that and get it down to um, at least less than nine, we'd probably make it seven. Probably do that through, you know, we'd have a CO2 plant and we'd sparge CO2 through there and make carbonic acid and drop the pH. Um, and in, in doing so, we'd up the alkalinity, which is a good thing. Um, so that's, that's the guts of the polishing plant. It'll probably be some kind of filtration system. Um, you know, whether it's like a, a macro filtration or an ultra filtration that uses membranes or it's a sand filter media, a multimedia type sand filter. We haven't quite figured that out. This, <laughs> we have this out for bid, this project here out for bid, and it's kind of a, a design, construct, operate bid. So we're gonna let people that are experts in water treatment tell us how they would do it. And then, uh, and then we'll let them do it. So, and, and this, it's not uncommon. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of companies out there that, that we can roll, roll in stuff on, in semi trucks and do water treatment. Um, the duration of this project being three to four years is probably doesn't lend itself to, you know, bringing stuff in on semis. It's probably more cost effective to actually build a building and, and bring equipment in and, and purchase the equipment. But, you know, we'll see. That's all part of their bids. But it'll definitely be some kind of pH adjustment to get it back into the circa neutral range of pH and a filtration process. So. What about water temperatures? You know, I, I've been asked a lot about that. I mean, we're pulling out, we're pulling out of a, a, a major reservoir up there. Um, so I, I gotta assume that, you know, it's gonna be cooler than, than, than stream water. But, the, but then, you know, it comes down to, comes down the hill on a piece of black pipe. Um, this pipeline, which is I think about five miles long, is buried in the ground, so that should help um, bring temperatures down. Um, you know, that's, I, I don't know. The short answer is I don't know. But I think it's gonna be cooler than, than, uh, you know, than Blacktail Creek at low flow conditions. I think that's, that's probably likely. Was that pipeline built, put in just specifically for something like this? And Yep. It's been there for a while. 03, I think, Joe. I think 04 is the one they finished it. Yep. Yeah. I think that was put in when they did the sub drain. I think it was all one shot. Oh. So, um, uh, how about TDS? TDS and, uh, yeah, TDS and, um, and whole effluent toxicity. So this is where you take your you take your effluent and you expose it to certain test organisms and see their reactions and stuff. TDS, which drives the whole effluent toxicity issue for this type of water, is is a concern. Um, the the acute the so there's two types of toxicity that can be imparted here: acute toxicity, where organisms actually die and chronic where they just don't uh, reproduce quite as well as a controlled sample. Acute toxicity has to be met at end of pipe. There cannot be any acute toxicity in this effluent and our tests, our tests indicate that's not, gonna, that's not gonna be a problem. The chronic toxicity for the invertebrate species, which is a, a species of water flea, that can be a problem, uh, particularly as we, we introduce more treated acid rock drainage of the tailings impoundment, we should see that TDS climb up to, to saturation. And uh, that could end up being a problem. But 
that that limit that limit is is measured uh, after complete mixing with Blacktail Creek. So that allows for some fresh water introduction um, and you know stream flow augmentation type scenarios. So um, that's one of the things. That's one of the critical tests here. You know, we, we've all heard about you know, the, you know potential scaling of the creek and that sort of thing. That's another test. But these are all things that you're really not going to find out how it actually works until you get several seasonal cycles through this system and, and see what happens. Um, you know, the, uh, finishing up on a wet test, that's, that's one of the concerns with this project that we're going to look at really hard. Um, uh, talking about stream scale, um, you know, we've done a bunch of mixing tests. We've done a lot of uh, scaling indice calculations. They've got a lot of equations for, you know, like boilers and stuff on what, you know, are you going to scale? All those indicate this shouldn't scale. But you're never going to know for sure until, until you do it. And there's lots of examples out there of treated acid rock drainage being discharged into receiving waters. And, you know, as they mix, you get a precipitate on, on the stream bottom. But there's also lots of examples where it doesn't happen. And fundamentally what it is is, you know, how much alkalinity is in the receiving water to, you know, if there's a lot of alkalinity, you can form some calcium carbonates. Um, Blacktail Creek does not have a lot of alkalinity. None of our waters here that come off the Bowler Bath Lift tend to have a lot of alkalinity. So it tends to indicate that there's a lower scale potential here than, than other places. But here again, until you get in, you know, and it's a function of temperature as well. So you, you get into that hot, low flow condition, is that gonna, that's gonna be the worst case. So that's one of the things we're gonna, we're gonna definitely keep an eye on and it's one of the purposes of this pilot test. Is the, uh, you made, did you say three million gallons a day? Is that what you're looking at? So, yeah. And, and how does that compare with, is part of the solution here kind of keeping the proportion between this release and Blackdale Creek in some sort of fixed proportion? Um, so, so the three million gallons we're talking about is what we're going to pump out of the Berkeley pit. That's the that average annual inflow to the Berkeley pit for the past couple of years has been right around 2.8. So I'm kind of a generalist, so I round that to three. But that's going to hold it. What we're going to try, what we're going to discharge is seven million gallons out of the tailings impoundment. And the reason, one of the reasons why we're discharging out of the tailings impoundment is, you know, we see, you know, we see like, you know, depending on the flow rate to the water treatment plant, you see, you know, 18 to 36 hours of residence time in the water treatment plant. That's all the time that that water has to come to complete equilibrium and get all those precipitation reactions, you know, through to completion. You put it up in the, because you notice all the water ends up in the tailings impoundment. You put it up there, it's got months of retention time. So what we see is where the water treatment plant may, may discharge at a, you know, 4,500 4, milligrams per liter TDS, the tailings impoundment is going to probably reach saturation around 3,600 milligrams per liter TDS. So that extra residence time, the, the, the direct precipitation that you get from the residence time, the influence from the upgrading streams, all this helps with the TDS and the toxicity issues. So that bottom line is tailings impoundment water is better water quality than, than we can get out of the water treatment plant. So. How much, comparatively, how much water, clean water are you getting from a couple of streams that come into the area? I think uh, I'm going off of just memory. I think it's it's about all all the whole catchment up there. I think contributes about 0.8 million gallons per day on average. So it's not a large. Yeah, it's not much. No. Mark, will it change your um, command from Silver Lake at all? Yeah. So as and this is happening right now. So as part of our freshwater reduction, fre part of our tailings impoundment wa stored water reduction, we've cut uh, Silver Lake water use down to. I think we're running somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8 million gallons per day, um, and about 250,000 of those gallons go to the water treatment plant. So the mine's running about, on about a half a million gallons a day. Um, and it's been that way, we've been doing that for a little over a year now, so we're not seeing any adverse impacts to the mine, so we'll, we'll probably stay in that range. 
Mm -hmm. What's the total use per day? So we bring we bring about 20 million gallons per day down the return water line, and then I don't. I mean, there's um, probably 30 or 40 million gallons just short short circuited right off those clarifiers right there. Our our water use is so. I mean, it's it's huge, but m you know, 90 percent of it is recycle. Better than that right now. So. that time where we actually have started that question and answer session already. <laughs> so I just would like to thank, first of all. <laughs> awesome. and, and if someone has questions, they still can, I guess, stay. But I don't want to contract the students <laughs> by going to their next class or something. Well, we have questions for Mark. Can we start another session on that? But I, I've got time, I, but I understand other people have other commitments. But, um. Pardon me? What are we going to miss? For if, if you leave? <laughs> um, I, I, I was telling Joe, I mean, this. This presentation that I give is so driven by the community or the audience questions that I, I don't really have a script for this. I just kind of do go through the water loop and then just open it up for questions and then I remember, oh yeah, I was one time I talked about this. One of the big things I did want to point out is uh, uh, this this uh, spring we got a sample from the Berkeley pit or, or the bureau got a sample from the Berkeley pit and the pH was 4.18. So what we've seen, you know, over the past five years is almost a, almost a two-point rise in pH, which is logarithmic, which is, means almost a, a hundred, hundred times less acidic. So the other thing we've noticed over the past couple of years um, is the pit's green. You know, it used to be a, kind of a dark, rusty brown. And... Uh, you know, where we had several hundred milligrams per iron in the Berkeley pit, we've got like 0.2 milligrams per iron. So that pH rise, we, we saw the iron precipitate out of the pit. So we've got some geochemical changes going on in the pit through, you know, not, not even pumping it. So, Stella? Well, that was uh, that was one of the reasons why you know the we, we, in, in consultation with the bureaus we wanted to get out and get as soon as we got quite a bit of ice on the pit this year we probably got 75 percent ice cover this year on a pit and that hasn't happened in a decade um, and so as soon as that ice came off we wanted the, the bureau to get out with their drone boat and get a, a profile it, did, did we have stratification you know what's going on and it's completely mixed. It's, there, is no, there is no thermocline or chemocline. It's completely mixed from a, from a conductivity and a temperature perspective, it's completely mixed. Did you test any of the ice? No. I'll let you get that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that there has been uh, studies on uh, what actually is alive in the pit water, but now as it actually is turning kind of green, that could be also an indication of like algae in yeah. there. Is there somebody actually who's looking at the, I know it's maybe hard to get samples from there, but as I understand there's we, <clears throat> we got some samples to uh, Grant Mittman and he was going to be looking at biological activity. Okay. Obviously as as the, 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 the pit if this trend continues becomes more hospitable, you know, yeah. that's a that is a dynamic that needs to be anticipated. Did, have you seen, uh, besides the rise in pH and decrease in iron, are there any, any significant changes in some of the metals? Uh, the, you know, Joe, there, prob there probably are, but those were, the, those were the ones that stood out when I looked at the data. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly wasn't. Copper? 
Yeah, that is of interest. So, yeah, so in 2012, we we shut down this this pumping station in part because some of the slides we saw down in this corner, a little bit hazardous to be down near the water level, but also because the grade of copper in the Berkeley pit had dropped to next to nothing. So it wasn't paying to get itself pumped up the hill. That copper grade has come back. So it's not to where it was when we started pumping the pit, but it's, it's, it's the same grade as, our, as uh, the grade we're getting out of our leach dumps. So, so I mean, I'm kind of a one-track person on some of these questions. Did you estimate a cost for kind of doing this at steady state? Kind of? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, that's part of what this is, uh, is getting at is, you know, what, what, are, what is this going to take to sustain? And what are those costs? So there was a question back over here a second. When you add the calcium to the line to the water, that's just going to be flushed out to the you know, pond up on top and you know, just accumulate there. Yeah. Um, you know, so you know, part of the treatment process in the Horseshoe Bend Water Treatment Plan is called a high density sludge. And that's where you recycle the sludge back. <coughs> and you're trying to get all the chemical reactions that occur on the surfaces of the sludge. And that increased surface area helps the kinetics of the reactions occur faster than just psh, slugging it with lime. One of the things we saw in 1996 when we did this is we've got 50,000 tons of ground up rock, ground up to the consistency of flour. Those are pretty good nuclei to start your precipitation reactions. So most of the contaminants fall out with the actual tailings, tailings themselves as a coating on the outside of those tailings. And, and then of course then you put, every year we're putting five feet of tailings on top of it. So th those contaminants are pretty, get pretty well sequestered in a hurry. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things we're going to test with on the chronic wet test is, you know, what, how, how, much, how much dilution do you need in the creek to, you know, per unit of effluent do you need to, to you know, to comply with that standard. So we're going to play with that through what we call, we call it a freshwater softening. It's, it's flow augmentation. Well, within the process, we've got a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, we're at saturation with gypsum. Uh, some people call it super saturation, but there's different forms of gypsum that aren't necessarily the stuff you read about in books. But yeah, that's a big problem. Of, when we get scale, like at the water treatment plant, it, it's not calcium carbonate. It's it's gypsum. But that so. uh, yeah. Um, if we were if we were going to discharge from the water treatment plant, the polishing facility would look a lot different. We'd have to somehow remove calcium and sulfate there. What we see is the tailings impoundment can do that for us. You know, here again, the the incredible amount of solids that it's getting mixed with when the lime comes in, that really drives that that uh, gypsum scaling towards the solids, and of course, out on the beach of the tailings, it scales what we want. So, um, so we get a lot of that TDS removal. We, we come to a true thermodynamic equilibrium of gypsum in the tailings impoundment, and, uh, and that, that helps a lot. Will, will Yankee Doodle, the water level there, remain the same or change at all? So, okay, so the, the Horseshoe Bend, uh, you know, we're, we're, we treat about 5 million gallons per day. I think we got 4.5 on this or it says 4.5 to 5. We treat about 5 million gallons per day. And right now it goes to the water treatment plant and comes in the mill, goes back up to the tailings impoundment. So that's, that 5 is neutral, right? We, we already do that 5. Where we're adding 3 to the system is out of the Berkeley pit. So we're a plus 3 million gallons per day with that. But we're going to bring 7 million gallons per day down the return water line and discharge that. So that puts us at a negative 4 million gallons per day from the tailings impoundment. So yeah, right it'll drop the tailings impoundment. So then when we get the tailings impoundment where we want it, we won't discharge seven anymore. 
So, but seven is kind of a good number um, because it is kind of the peak flow for the system. That's if we ever had to go to a straight discharge system, like if the mine shut down or something like that, that's the number. That's about the number we're looking at. So seven's a good number to test with. Is anything being introduced back into the pit, either like from the horseshoe bend? So some of this improved water quality is coming from the, the unreacted alkalinity in the sludge from the water treatment plant. That's where some of this excess alkalinity is coming from. But the other theory is, is you know, we're getting near the critical water level and the, the critical water level was established so that the pit continues to control the groundwater level, but it was also a convenient level where most of the underground workings are inundated. So our acidity coming at us is probably greatly reduced as well. Sure. How long do you guys estimate that you're going to uh, release 7 million gallons a day before you get Yankee Doodle down to where you want it? Uh, depending on how long, you know, if we can sustain 7 and not 5 or 3, but, you know, 3 to 4 years we're thinking. So are we seeing any changes in the water quality in the, in the shafts or the wells around the Okay. You know, that's probably a better question for someone like Ted, but, um, you know, we don't sample a lot of the, the shafts. Um, and I haven't looked at the data on, on, on some of the wells that we do sample.